Many of us are only now, after so long, coming back into Melbourne CBD. If you've come in for the footy, a show, or to catch up with friends, it's a pretty good feeling. But the sight of empty shops and offices makes it clear the pandemic has had a massive impact. And with the JobKeeper scheme about to end, there are tough times ahead for the state's economic and cultural heart. In a series of stories this week, we're talking to the people who live and work in the CBD about what's needed to revive its famous streets and laneways. Melbourne is slowly waking from its deepest slumber. Once empty trains are filling up and that all too familiar peak hour snarl is coming back. But it's looking and feeling very different, largely because of people like Olivia Cordner. Throughout COVID we were working in the, this tiny little flat in the same room for, what was it, six plus months. I've saved the report template in the folder. What did you need me to fill out? Her new flexible working week, two days in the city, three at home, means the office administrator and her partner could flee the inner city and buy their first house in Geelong. My boss did say, if you'd asked me this a few years ago, I would have said no. Um, so I think, yeah, COVID really helped to prove that people could work from home and it was just as effective. Amongst people who are working from home, about half of those are quite happy to continue working from home. Some would even like to work at home more. And that will affect the CBD. I mean, in the medium term, we could see perhaps a 20% difference compared to before COVID. Any city would be rocked by the loss of tens of thousands of office workers. On top of that, massive numbers of international students are still not back. Shoppers are staying online and international tourism has stalled. No wonder so many people are worried about the future of this city. One of the really emotional moments was um, just a small business and, um, and a guy that I knew from across the road, he was a shoemaker and I saw the four lease sign on his shop and I was so sad because that was two generations and, um, and you'll never see that again. That shoemaker is Stephen Ricaris. International students accounted for 40% of his city customers. With so many gone, he made the agonising decision to close the business his father started in 1958 and move to Coburg. Very sad because here I only see cars go past. In the city I saw people go past, you know, people that lived there. I, I miss that. It's been a seismic shock to the city. Historian Robin Anir says you'd have to go back to the recession of the 1890s to see something similar. Melbourne contracted seriously at that time, money-wise, and really lost its glory to Sydney forever as the first city. But there was still the need to use the city in the way it had been used before. There weren't technological options at that time to work from home. So no, I can't think of a, a shock to rival this one. So the question now is, how does the CBD recover? And what sort of city do we want it to be into the future? The exchange of ideas has begun. Getting people back is absolutely crucial. That's num number one. And it's students, it's tourists, it's skilled migrants, and it's family migrants. We accept that the way that we work has changed forever. Does that need to be a bad thing for the city of Melbourne? Uh, we would say no. This could be a moment where we uh, perhaps downplay the role of the CBD within our metropolitan um, uh, structure. I think there's so much opportunity with uh, office spaces and we need to think totally outside the box. Watching it come back to life is exciting, just thinking about how's it going to change, what might be possible. Stephen Ricaris's time in the city is over, but he's optimistic Melbourne can bounce back. We were a quiet city back in the 60s and 70s. I think people start coming in. We just got to have something to attract us to come in. Welcome back to the office, everyone. It's kind of the first time for me that I'm physically starting to see people. Melbourne's office workers have been away so long, there are classes teaching them how to come back. It was a bit of those sort of first day back at school nerves. 
The accounting firm KPMG is introducing what it calls a three hub model. Client, home or office, and you can work across any of those at your choice. I can see myself working from home for a day, working from the client office for three days and then maybe a day in the office every now and then. Previously, you probably looked down at people working from home a bit and um, you're like, oh, are you really working? Don't worry, employers like KPMG are checking. Turns out those at home are just as productive. We monitor just when they're online and for how long. Um, not a lot of difference. As a sign of the times, one of the nine floors at the firm's Docklands headquarters is now up for sublease. Because we do expect we're going to have less people in the office each day from what we've seen. Four lease signs have been going up like graffiti around the city. Docklands in particular has been hit hard. Every single floor in this building here in Burke Street is empty. So what do we do with all this space? Conversion to apartments is something that's been quite a popular idea and something that we've been investigating. Could we be recycling that office space to provide a social bonus uh, that comes out of COVID to house those who are unhoused? What are some of the pop-ups that we might be able to create in those office spaces? You might never otherwise have thought about those for the creative sector. The exodus of CBD workers leaves small businesses like this one, just off Linders Lane, struggling to survive. It's scary potentially having to lose everything that we've worked so hard for in the last um, six years. Kerry and Jeff Chu are focusing more on a new type of customer, the so-called TWT worker, who only comes in on Tuesdays, Wednesdays and Thursdays. People coming to the office, uh, organising meetings and wanting food and catering. So that has been something that we would, wa would want to build upon. Some argue the work from home trend is not such a bad thing to take a bit of heat out of the city. You think back to 2019, you know, peak hour and things like that, if you were on a tram, it, we were probably a bit over full capacity. So I'm not sure that's, that's a terrible thing. Many of our suburbs have been underserviced in terms of civic amenity, civic facilities like art galleries, uh, museums. Think about opportunities to put more of those um, major civic facilities in suburban locations. But for the Chews, having a lively city is more important than ever. We are expecting our first baby in just less than three weeks' time. So Jeff and I are very excited but also very nervous about uh, what would happen to the shop. Hopefully it would bounce back up. The digs are here, just waiting, where hundreds of international students should be mingling, facilities lie empty, while so many wait offshore. My memories of Uni Melbourne and Melbourne are fading. While many students here now have the chance to return to face-to-face -face learning, Pavani Ambagahawatta must wait before dawn in Sri Lanka to attend her lectures online. Less than ideal, for sure, but the pandemic and a lack of financial support from Australia gave her no choice. After months and months, I decided that I needed the support of my family and I also felt like it was kind of futile to be constantly paying rent and, you know, living costs to be in Melbourne when there was no reason for me to be in Melbourne. We miss them in so many ways, international students. I think it's another aspect of our city, a vital aspect that in many ways we took for granted. International students pay big money to get a degree here, along the way pumping billions of dollars into the local economy. Or maybe like more than just a cash cow. Cash cow with a personality. Pavani is right. International students bring so much more than money. They bring life and energy to the city. There are so many reasons to want them back. Yet no one seems to want to prioritise students when there are tens of thousands of Australians still stranded overseas. It's been a case of pass the parcel, you know, no one wanting to get the voters offside by. Former State Liberal Minister Phil Honeywood is now a lobbyist in the international education sector. Three months ago, he put forward a plan for the industry to bring back students who would quarantine in existing accommodation. He's heard nothing from the state government. New South Wales, South Australia, the ACT and even the Northern Territory, a much further advance than Victoria is in bringing international students back while the state blames the Commonwealth. Whether it's the City of Melbourne, South Australia, New South Wales or ourselves, doesn't matter what idea you have to deliver it, if you can't get people on the flights, um, it's a no-goer. This former Premier believes the only way around the political timidity is for states to share the political risk. 
South Australia, Victoria, New South Wales and Queensland all moving ahead in unison to say, yes, we'd like to get students back. John Brumby says international students are so crucial to Melbourne, it's worth making a long-term investment to build standalone quarantine. At Melbourne Airport, at Avalon, it's got to be close to a, an airport. I think they've shown in the Northern Territory these, these things work. You've got a self-contained workforce, you've got a gap between the units. That will take time. Till then, the missing students must watch this space. Life and laughter have returned to the city streets. The comedy festival is back. I'm just so excited. I'm even seeing people around. You feel alive again. The city needs it, so looking forward to it. But the pandemic lurks behind every punchline. People are a little bit unsure about the interaction and even on the street some people are like it was two years ago and other people are a little bit scared. Melbourne needs its events like never before. If those events and exhibitions aren't happening, the, the, the city's a bit of a ghost town. Within weeks of the first lockdown, events company Harry the Hira had to fire more than a thousand workers, leaving just 50. And you can just imagine the, the, um, the damage that that caused to so many lives. And the small businesses that depend on events could go under while they wait for the next major plans in spring. We do ask for some form of targeted support to ensure that that gap can be breached. It's just this critical six months. Fear of a barren winter is one of the reasons Melbourne City Council is set to finally start its Melbourne Dollars Dining Scheme. Melbourne Dollars will be part of that irresistible offer to keep people coming. That's good news for laneway restaurant owners like David James. He's worried about how long it's taking to bring back the foot traffic, the vibe that makes Melbourne famous. The impact of this shutdown on Melbourne, it's been like burning down the Harbour Bridge. He's urging the council to support ideas like a laneway festival with his neighbours. All the business owners down here would participate in something like that. That's, it's not for one business, but it's for the laneway, it's actually for Melbourne. The State Library wants to do its bit and tap into a burgeoning experience economy, drawing in new crowds for unique events, as it did recently in the Fashion Festival. We had the most amazing night under the dome. And then afterwards, of course, people flowed out of here and went and enjoyed food and beverage experiences around uh, the city. There's no doubt the pandemic is reshaping Melbourne and there's no shortage of great ideas about how to revive the city. Some are warning though, in times of crisis, there can be a temptation to try to fix things too quickly. My hope would be that it's not too um, systematised from, from above. You know, what do you the, mean? Well, just the idea of, well, we'll, uh, we'll have precincts and we'll, we'll shut these streets and so on. You'd, you'd like to hope that the changes will be somewhat organic. I'm kind of concerned that snapping back immediately to what we were in late 2019, um, uh, we'll get the greatest hearing. But there's optimism that Melbourne can emerge from this crisis better than ever. This really is a moment in time for Melbourne and I think the key is for us to do it together.